This is my first video update from Nicosia, Cyprus on this Sunday morning. For everyone that is celebrating Easter this Sunday, I wish you a very happy Easter, peaceful Easter, and I hope you enjoy the day. Let's now talk about some news and let's start things off with another document leak. The second document leak in three days. And this document leak dropped yesterday and it focuses on Ukraine, but it also goes beyond Ukraine. It also has documents connected to China and the Middle East. The New York Times is reporting that the document leak from yesterday was about 100 documents. And Intel officials told the NYT that this document leak is a nightmare. That is what Intel officials told the New York Times. Now, in my video update from yesterday, I said that I believed the document leak from Thursday, which focused only on Ukraine, I said that it looked like some sort of saya. I have received messages from various professionals in this area who have assured me that the document leak from Thursday was indeed legit. And so I started to to poke around a bit and from what I understand in the document leak from Thursday there was some information about Russian troop presence in Ukraine and let me pull up a tweet here and read it out to everybody Noteworthy from the leaks, and this is in reference to the leaks on Thursday. I'm walking in another parking lot, but this parking lot is full of buses. Buses and the church. And uh, this, this tweet is referring to the leaks from Thursday. And it says, noteworthy from the leaks. Russia has 527... 97% of its 544 battalions committed to Ukraine, with 474, 90% of those inside Ukraine. Russian army outside of Ukraine area non-existent currently. Now this 97% number reminded me of something and I thought about it, and I was like, 97% of Russian troops, according to the document leaks from Thursday, from Thursday, are in Ukraine. 97% of Russia's army is in Ukraine? 544 battalions committed to Ukraine? Really? I was like, huh, that sounds very, very familiar that information and then it hit me I did a clown world on this Ben Wallace the UK defense minister he made a statement about a month and a half ago where he said that 97 percent of Russia's army Russia's military is committed to Ukraine and I did a clown world on this and I said, you know, if 97% of Russia's military is committed to Ukraine, then why not just invade the rest of Russia? UK, USA, NATO. If you only have 3% of the Russian military to uh, defend all of Russia because the other 97% is bogged down in Ukraine, well then... What are you guys waiting for? Why don't you march into Moscow? Should be pretty easy. You're only facing an army of 3%. <laughs> so I did a clown world on this. And then the leaks, from what I understand, the leaks actually say 
that 97% of Russia's military is bogged down in Ukraine. And so that leads me to believe that these documents, I'm not saying the information in these documents is true or accurate, but it leads me to believe that the documents were indeed created by the collective West. These are collective West documents. And these are the documents where Ben Wallace got his 97% of Russian forces in Ukraine number from. He had access to these documents. He was briefed by UK Intel from these documents. And he came out and gave an interview and said, hey, everybody, 97% of Russia's forces are bogged down in Ukraine. So I'm not saying the information in these documents is accurate. I don't know. <laughs> I doubt that 97% of Russia's forces are bogged down in Ukraine. That's laughable. I would say it's probably the reverse. I would say that 3% of Russia's forces are bogged down in Ukraine. And the other 97 is, is, uh, is protecting the rest of Russia. But I'm not saying the information in the documents from Thursday is, is accurate, but the, the, the documents are indeed from Collective West Intel. And those are the documents that Ben Wallace got his 97% number from, which means that Ben, Wall ben Wallace was briefed from these documents, saw these documents, and gave an interview after reading these documents. So the documents from Thursday, I believe are legit. I've changed my mind, <laughs> changed my mind. <laughs> I believe they're legit and I think the people that, actually I know that the people that messaged me, the professionals in this business that messaged me and said these documents are legit, they know what they're talking about. These documents are legit. And this little piece of information, just this little bit of information, confirms this for me, for me. So the documents released yesterday, well, I think those are legit. And there's another piece of information from the documents released yesterday that has led me to believe that those documents are legit. And it's information on Ukraine's air defense. Now, let me read you a tweet here, which says, according to the report, in reference to the documents leaked yesterday, according to the report, SA-10, S-300, and SA-11 book comprise of 89% of Ukraine's air defense, medium high range. Book will be depleted by the 31st of March, 2023. S-300 will be depleted by 02 May, 2023. So from the documents from yesterday, the Buk missiles have already been depleted. March has already passed. And in a couple of weeks, the S-300s will be depleted. Ukraine's S-300 air defense missiles will be depleted. Now, I believe this information is accurate. And I think there's two indications to, to show that. The first one is that... Brian Berletic from the New Atlas and Alexander Mercuris from the Duran. They have been reporting now for the past month that the Russian military has been using their air force more and more, especially in the Avdivka region. And in their reports, they claim that the reason the Russians are more confident and more comfortable to use their air force is because they have understood that Ukraine has depleted its air defense in various regions. And it's probably moved most of its air defense to protect Ukraine, leaving other regions exposed, including Avdiivka. And so the Russians are more confident to use their air force in, uh, in the Avdiivka region. And that points to Ukraine air defense being depleted. That's why you're seeing the Russian Air Force more and more. And Brian and Alexander have been reporting on this. I mean, Brian has, has made a point to, to, uh, to stress how important uh, this information is. Because 
if Russia's air force is is more free to to operate in Ukraine, that's that's a huge deal, and that's big trouble for the Ukraine military. So, the report from yesterday says that in two three weeks, Ukraine's S three hundred is is gone. The books are already gone. This makes up eighty nine percent of their medium and high range air defense. And we've seen over the past month, the Russians use their air force more and more in Avdivka. So that's the first indication to me, in my mind, that the report from yesterday is indeed accurate. The Russian military knows that uh, Ukraine is, is running through their, their air defense missiles. They know it. And so we're seeing their air, their air force more and more. Now, the second piece of information that leads me to believe that the report from yesterday is indeed accurate, is legit, is what I talked about on my video yesterday morning, which is that the Ukraine Defense Minister Reznikov was in Greece looking for weapons. And the Greek government, they gave him ammunition, but they didn't give Reznikov what he really wanted. What he really wanted was S-300s. That is what he wanted, because Greece, Greece has got Russian S-300 air defense. And Reznikov wanted the S-300 air defense. And the Greek government said, we can't give over the S-300 air defense. And so the fact that Reznikov was running around Europe looking for S-300 air defense systems, missiles, leads me to believe that Ukraine is running very low on S-300. So, that is why I believe the leak from yesterday is accurate. I now believe that the leak from Thursday is accurate, and we have got two big leaks in three days. Why is the New York Times reporting on this? Probably to get ahead of the story, because this is causing a lot of trouble for the collective West and for their intelligence sharing, and the story was going to get out sooner or later, and so I believe the CIA, the three-letter agencies, they contacted the New York Times, and they said, look, we got to get ahead of this because these documents are, are out there, and the media is going to start reporting on this, so we need the New York Times to to get out in front of this and to start giving our narrative of the situation because this is causing us a lot of trouble. A nightmare is what the intel officials told the New York Times. And it is causing friction between the collective West allies and how they work together to, to wage this proxy war against Russia. And that is what these documents show, that this is indeed a proxy war. Look at this tweet from, from Michael Tracy. One second here, and let me pull it up. So from the document leak, I believe on Thursday, Michael Tracy, he points out a paragraph from the New York Times article, which says, one official said it was likely that the documents did not come from Ukrainian officials because they did not have access to the specific plans which bear the imprint of the offices of the Pentagon's joint staff. And Michael Tracy says, in reference to this New York Times paragraph from their article reporting on the leaks, translation, Ukraine officials don't have access to their own war planning materials, which are the sole property of the U.S. Yeah. Ukrainians don't have access to their own war planning materials, which means that this war is being exclusively planned by the collective West, and then the orders are filtered down to Olensky and Zeluzhny and Shirsky. That's 
That's what these documents show. Another thing that these documents show, these leaked documents, is that uh, they show a Ukraine military that is not prepared for this, Brit for this big offensive. Alexander pointed this out in his video from yesterday. He said that the documents show a Ukraine military that has not received everything that they've asked for and is still waiting for a lot of equipment and is simply not ready for this big spring offensive. But the spring offensive is being pushed on them by the likes of Blinken and Sullivan and Newland. And so these documents, what they could actually do is they could hurt the morale of the Ukraine military because the Ukraine military is going to be like, look, you're you're sending us to to fight the Russians and your goal is to take Crimea. But we're still waiting on all of this equipment that uh, you guys promised us. So what do we do now? You know, it's going to really hurt their morale. A document leak like this, which is why Podoliak. Alensky's BFF, he came out right away and said these documents are photoshopped and they're not legit because the Alensky regime, they understand that these documents make them look really bad. It makes it look like the U.S. and NATO is planning this war and Ukraine has no say in what's going on. And it makes it uh, appear that the collective West is is taking their, their sweet time in getting the equipment that the Ukraine military has been asking for. And the equipment is not arriving. And as this equipment is not, arri is not arriving, they're pushing the Ukraine military to launch an offensive against Russia without the equipment that they need. And so you're sending them into certain failure. And so if you're you're a soldier in the Ukraine military, you're going to be like, screw this, <laughs> screw this. Anyway, that's the, uh, that's enough on the leaks. How about we talk about the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant and we expose the lies in and around the ZNPP. And these lies were exposed by the UK media publication, The Times. So I'm not going to debunk the lies around the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. The Times has already done it for us. And so The Times decided to run an article. I don't know why they decided to run this article, but they did. They ran an article the other day admitting that the Ukraine military did indeed plan an attack against the ZNPP in order to take it over. And this was not a small operation. This was 600 men and something like 30 boats. And the operation failed. The Russians destroyed the Ukraine forces. Now, at the time of this operation, the Russians were saying, yeah, Ukraine is trying to, to launch an attack against the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. And this is, this is not only stupid, but it's dangerous because it's a nuclear power plant. And at the time that the Russians were saying, this is, this is a really reckless and dumb idea by the Alensky regime, the collective West media, including the UK media, were telling us that the Russians are lying. The Russians are shelling their own nuclear power plant. The Russians are, uh, are the ones that have put the power plant in, uh, in danger. And they're the ones that are risking some sort of nuclear meltdown. And everyone was blaming the Russians and saying what the Russians are reporting about the ZMPP is false. It's fake news. And now we get a report from the Times with maps. They even put maps of this operation admitting that, yes, it was indeed the Alensky regime and the Ukraine military that was launching attacks towards the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. So we have that admission from UK media, why the UK media is 
is admitting this? Why they're discussing this? I have no idea. It is getting very windy. And once again, I am left without my audio. Ah, boy. I failed to prepare for the wind of Cyprus. Let's, uh, let's talk about two more stories. Maybe I can find a place here that's less windy. Let's talk about two more stories here. And in my video from yesterday, I talked about the foreign policy article in a Polish publication that put out an article about the recreation of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So I mentioned how we have a lot of mainstream media now in the collective West talking about recreating the, the Polish-Lithuanian Empire. And Medvedev yesterday, he came out with some statements along the lines of there's no need for Ukraine to exist, stuff like that, he said. He said these statements on, on Telegram and build, they picked up on Medvedev's telegram post, his rant, and build talked about how Medvedev dreams of a Russian empire, Putin's lapdog yapping at Ukraine. That is what build reported in reference to Medvedev's rant on Ukraine. And I thought, I thought about what Medvedev said, and I thought about Bill's reporting here where they say that Russia once, to, once again is dreaming of, of the Russian Empire. And then I thought about the, the foreign policy publication was the title of that of that publication that foreign policy put out there it's time to bring back the polish lithuanian union from foreign policy magazine and i thought about the polish publications that are talking about the polish lithuanian union and i thought you know the collective west is going on and on about how russia wants to recreate the empire they want to recreate the Russian Empire. They want to recreate the Tsar's Empire. They want to recreate the Soviet Union. Putin wants to recreate the Soviet Union. And then I, uh, I thought about the Polish-Lithuanian Empire. And isn't that the same thing? Isn't this projection? They're telling us that Russia wants to recreate the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union and the Tsar Empire or whatever they, they go on and on about, while at the same time, they openly admit that one of their goals, at least the neocons, one of their goals is to create a Polish-Lithuania, recreate the Polish-Lithuanian Empire. How is that any different than this narrative that Russia wants to create the Tsars, the Tsarist empire. How is that any different? So it's bad for Russia to want to create an imperial Russia, which they don't, but I'm just saying, let's just say that is the narrative. It's bad for Russia to want to create or recreate the Russian empire, whatever that even means, but for us, it's perfectly okay to openly talk about recreating the Polish-Lithuanian Empire, which means swallowing up much of uh, Ukraine, Western Ukraine, taking a chunk out of Belarus and everything else that the Polish-Lithuanian Empire entails. So it's good for, for the collective West to want to create empires, but for Russia, bad. Even though Russia has never said that they want to create an empire, 
<laughs> the Russian media, the Russian state, they've never said, we want to create an empire. Here we have neocons over the past month writing on and on about recreating the Polish-Lithuanian empire. We even have little meetings taking place in Poland between Duda and Alensky. Who knows what they're talking about? Maybe they're talking about creating a Polish-Lithuanian empire. I don't know. I don't know. Blinken was talking about another chance, uh, another go at regime change in Belarus a couple of weeks ago when he was giving a testimony to Congress. He was saying, we're going to create, the U.S. is going to create a special envoy who is going to coordinate with uh, Svetlana Juan Guaido Tikhanovskaya and the government, the, the fake Guaido government in exile. Where are they located? In Lithuania and Poland the Belarus fake government in exile. And this envoy for the U.S. is going to coordinate with all of them to try and give regime change in Belarus another go. So they're creating envoys. They have governments, these these pretend governments in exile, these Juan Guaido make-believe governments in Poland and Lithuania. Lenski's traveling to Poland and meeting with Duda. And who knows what they're talking about. They've created unions as well. They've talked about the Lublin uh, Treaty and the Lublin Union and all of these things where, you know, Polish uh, citizens can can uh, work and live in Ukraine and Ukrainians can live and work in Poland and there's no borders. There's nothing separating the two. And you have all of these articles talking about recreating the Polish-Lithuanian Empire. But... But when Medvedev goes on a, on a telegram rant, well, then Russia has crazy dreams, evil dreams about recreating the Russian empire. Russia is evil. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I would mention that. Let's, um, let's do another story. Actually, let me stop the video and I'm going to put my... Uh, my dead cat on the mic and get back to you. I'm back and now I, uh, I have the wind protection on the mic. So uh, I apologize if, if some, of the video, some of the video's audio may not be the best quality. I wasn't anticipating this much wind. It started out okay as I began my walk, but then when I came further down here, it's, it started to, to get very windy. So I'll try to fix it up in post. But uh, this, the, the final parts of this video will be, will be good. The audio will be very, very good. So let's um, talk about one more story and we'll do a couple of clown worlds. And the story that I want to talk about is actually kind of a clown world, I guess. <laughs> this is from Fox News. They ran a post, a story saying the FBI turns to social media recruits Russians for intelligence gathering. The FBI has turned to social media to help it ramp up its Russian recruitment and intelligence gathering as the war in Ukraine continues to rage with no end in sight. It's a move receiving mixed reviews from Russia experts. In a video posted to Facebook and Twitter, scenes from the U.S. Capitol and the Russian embassy are displayed as a voice speaking in Russian tells the listeners that the FBI can change their future if they can provide the U.S. with intelligence. The narrator says the FBI is looking for spies, expats, and anyone with information on countering the Kremlin. Do you want to change your future, Alan Kohler, from the FBI's counterintelligence division questions while speaking in English directly to the camera? The FBI values you. The FBI can help you but only you have the power to take the first step. The FBI appears to have launched its social media program in February in an attempt to encourage Russians to turn away from the Kremlin and Russian President Vladimir Putin's aggression after more than a year of war in Ukraine and heightened geopolitical tension with the West. The FBI openly recruiting Russians to give up important information. In a new video shared with millions around the globe on Twitter, Facebook and Google, bureau officials speak directly to Russian citizens, expatriates, even spies looking to break free. Do you want to change your future? The FBI values you. The FBI can help you. 
but only you have the power to take the first step. They are so desperate for regime change in Russia. Incredible. So that's the video from the FBI asking Russians to, to give them a call, send them an, e an email. Actually, the video even says to come to Washington and drop by their headquarters. Drop by the FBI headquarters and tell them all the info on Vladimir Putin. <laughs> give them all of the, the information on Putin. All right, let's do a couple of clown worlds. The first clown world is... Putin's popularity, since we're talking about turning on the Russian government and turning on Putin, Newsweek read an article that said Putin's popularity in the U.S. has reached an all-time high, according to a YouGov poll, which showed that 91% of Americans know who Vladimir Putin is, and 21% of Americans approve of his activity. He's catching up to uh, Joe Bidenopoulos, Greece's favorite son, approve, approval rating. <laughs> He's getting very, very close to the approval rating of Bidenopoulos. What's Bidenopoulos' approval rating? On, on a low end, it's like 38, 36. On the high end, it's what, 40, 44, 46? So I don't know, another 10, 15 points, and Putin will be as popular as Joe Bidenopoulos. <laughs> 91% though of Americans know who, who Putin is. He's got name recognition. He should run for president. <laughs> All right, let's, um, let's see. I have a couple of more clown worlds. I definitely have one more clown world. And that has to do with Macron's statement when he was in Beijing. Macron said that it's not right for Belarus to have Russian nuclear weapons deployed in Belarus. Not transferred, but deployed. And Macron said that it's unacceptable to have Russian nuclear weapons deployed in Belarus. That is what he told the press during a press. That's what, that is what he told the press. Ugh. That is what he told the press during a press conference. <laughs> and um, Lukashenko, well, he responded to Macron's statement. And he agreed with Macron's statement. He said that he is in agreement with Macron. That's why we have to withdraw all U.S. nuclear weapons from five or six countries where they are deployed and return them to the Americans. So Macron and Lukashenko have found a point of agreement. They agree that nuclear weapons deployed in other countries, Russian, U.S., whatever, nuclear weapons that are deployed on the territories of other countries, they should be returned back to the country. So Russia should take back the nukes deployed in Belarus, and uh, the United States should take back the nukes that are deployed in in a variety of other countries. <laughs> Peskov also uh, commented on Macron's statement and Peskov said that, that it's the first time he's heard Macron speak so, so harshly against the United States, criticize the United States in such a way. That is what Peskov said because Macron's statement, while it applies to the Russian nuclear weapons deployed in Belarus, it absolutely app applies to nuclear weapons deployed by the United States in a variety of other countries. So Lukashenko and Peskov both making fun of Macron's statements regarding nukes. And I think, I think those are my clown worlds. No, I have one more clown world. One more quick clown world. And I reported on how NPR, a couple of days ago, I reported how NPR, their account on Twitter, has received the state media label. Well, we, had, we now have the BBC. I'm not sure when this label went up on the BBC, but I noticed it, and so I figured I will, I will report it to everybody. BBC's profile on Twitter has been labeled government-funded. 
Maybe this is this label has been on the BBC's profile for a while now. Maybe not, but either way, it's good to see these media outlets finally getting the government-funded or state-affiliated media label on their profiles. And the BBC is without a doubt, without question, the BBC is UK government sponsored and funded with UK taxpayers having to flip the bill for the BBC's existence, which from what I understand is very unpopular with a majority of taxpayers in the UK. They're not happy about having to pay for the BBC, but the BBC's profile on Twitter has finally gotten a state affiliated government funded label on it. So good on Twitter, good on Elon Musk for doing that. That is the video, everybody, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble and let me cross here. Rumble and Rockfin, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, and go to the Duran shop, 10% off. Use the code good day and check out the Duran's Instagram shop page where we are running a variety of giveaways a link is in the description box down below take care